This episode of Thinking Tackle is in association with Daiwa Infinity Rods. That is not easy. Well, welcome to Thinking Tackle Show 3. As you might have guessed, we're back at Walthamstow Reservoirs and uh, against the opinion of all the crew and the director, we're back here in the middle of March to try and catch some of the massive carp that are in these waters. Now, you may remember last year, if you get a bit of deja vu, I came over here with Nick Hellier. We had horrible easterly winds and we didn't do any good at all. Now. The temperatures have been up to 19 degrees last week. It's now seven degrees, so it's dropped 12 degrees in a week. Um, so we're back almost to winter conditions, but we're going to try anyway. I brought Adam Penning over here with me as well, and we're going to fish two completely contrasting styles. I'm going to use boilies because I've been on these lakes all winter and I've been trickling a bit of bait in. So I'm going to keep using the bait I've been using all winter. And then Adam's going to use the instant approach because he's only ever fished over here once before. So he's going to fish with maggots and little tiny boilies. There's great big bream in here and I'm sure he's going to pick a few of those up but he might pick up a carp as well. So I'm going to get round to my spot. When we're both in the swims, we're going to talk you through why we're putting the baits where we're putting them, and then we're going to have a look at the rigs and the approach as well. So join us in a second in the swims. <sighs> I've chosen a swim on the number two reservoir called the Tea Party 2 because there's two swims really close together, so it's a nice social area. And I'm going to fish one rod down there, that's my banker rod, but before I cast down there, I'm just going to trickle a few baits in with the throwing stick because I think it's better to scare the fish away from the area with bait than it is with a rig. And we've seen that when we've done the underwater films. If you throw a few baits over the spot, the fish disappear off out the spot for a little while, but they will come back in. If you cast the lead right on their heads, they go and they don't come back for hours. So that's a little tip you can put in your own fishing. Always trickle a few baits in first, just to push the fish out of the area, then get your rigs in and hopefully they'll drift back and you'll get a quick bite. The third rod is going out to the island just to fish off that canopy there. That's another good area in this swim. So I'm going to whack that one out now and then we're going to go over to Adam's swim and see where he's putting his bait. What's going on, son? I thought we were doing location. Oh, mate. That was a plan, but the carp have had other ideas. I just, uh, I was having a look around and put sort of mile in the bailiff. Oh yeah. Told me I've seen a really big fish down by the first island, same area where I said about yeah. those two last night. Right. So I've gone wound in, gone and had a look for half an hour, I've seen seven. All just definite little, carp. little shows, but definitely carp. So uh, I'm just going to get on my toes and get down there. So I'm going to be a bit antisocial and crack on. I want to get down there before anyone else gets in oh, there. So the way you put six pints of maggots out yesterday, <coughs> you're leaving that, yeah? I am, mate, because I haven't seen anything out here, so. All right, fair enough. They're I'll down there, so come round for a tea when I'm sorted, all right? <laughs> okay, okay, I'll leave you to it. I'll see you a bit later on. All right, mate, see you in a bit. Okay, well we're round in Adam's second swim of the day and we have just seen one literally 
seconds ago um, over the top of the right hand rod, mate, wasn't it? It was, yeah, right on it, Dan. I mean, it's been really high drama, hasn't it, the last sort of half an hour or so. How many do you reckon you've seen? Oh, well, I mean, seven made me move, didn't it? I mean, since I've been round you've here. You've seen seven to move. To move, and then since I've been here, just, you know, trying to get the gear sorted, so not looking really hard, and there's been. I don't know, another 20 probably. 20? Yeah, plus 10 bream. <laughs> right. and, That's like you know. 19 more than I've seen all winter long. A lot of the ones that have been inside my zone have been smaller fish, you know, sort of look, almost looking like doubles, which would be brilliant, It'd be well chuffed, but yeah. there's some real good ones over the back there, so I'm not going to do you a cup of tea here either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go not again. Moving again. I've got it, mate. There's, there's some really good fish over there. In front of that swim called the Crows, and it's never empty, like, so I'm going to. I'm going to go around there, I think. <laughs> OK, I might even drop in here then. We've baited this area as well yesterday evening because there was no one fishing here and we just baited out in that middle area which is a known producing area so I'm going to give it the last few hours in here, we've got to be off by 9 o'clock tonight, it's late night closing on a Monday, so we're going to give it the last few hours and see if we can produce a bite. Adam's moved round to the other side, he's now more comfortable and he's not fishing at such a distance, hopefully we're going to get a couple. Well, it is the, uh, the morning after the night before. I've gone back in the same swim in the life boy spot where I saw the fish crashing late last night. And I've only been here about an hour and I'm in. Left hand rod's gone. It's only fishing about 20 yards out off the back of this bitter northerly wind. And it's a very, very pretty little mirror. Looks like a mid-double. He's just about woken up now. I've got the other rods back leaded. Once we've got him in, what we're going to do is talk you through the boilies that I'm using because I'm doing a few different things to them which is going to make, give you an advantage on these sort of day ticket waters and it's also going to help when you're fishing over a soft bottom like I am. It's very silty out there and what I'm doing makes all the difference. Come on baby. There we go. Got him! Excellent! That is a very, very good result on what has turned into a very, very evil session. But here he is. Nice little start to the day. 17 pound wall from Stone Mirror. Puck a little fish. Absolutely stunning. You might have seen there while I was playing him. I've got a flying back lead and a back lead on. And later on in the show, we're going to talk you through why I'm doing that. I've got fluorocarbon main line on as well, and it's all for a reason. So we're going to get this beautiful little fella back, get the rod back out again, and then first of all, we're going to have a look at that all important bait. Now let's show you what I'm actually fishing with. Unlike most of the other shows, I'm just using boilies. You know, I'm a fan of spotting and small baits and chopping baits up. Well, this winter I've been fishing Walthamstow all winter long and I've been trickling bait into a few swims at the end of each session because you can't night fish here. So on the way back to the car, I'm using the catapult and just baiting up a few spots just to get the fish eating it and moving around. And that's the bait. It's a new mainline bait. It's going to come out next year. It hasn't got a name at the moment. And if I compare these washed out ones to the ones straight out the bag, that illustrates why I'm doing it. In the morning, the baits are going to look like that on the bottom in my right hand there. They look like that straight out of the bag. So if I wash them out, when I cast out first thing in the morning with these washed out ones, they look exactly the same as the one I've put in the night before. It's not really the smell, it's the look that I'm really looking for. So compare the two there, you can see how much different they look and I think that's getting me bites sooner. 
And the other thing about washing your baits out is you're drawing water into them before you chuck them out onto the silty bottom. These places are very, very soft on the bottom and that smell of the silt can draw into the bait very quickly. So if you saturate them with water first, that silt doesn't go into them as quickly. Now you don't want to be saturating them with normal tap water, you want to use lake water. And it doesn't matter if you're not using the water from the lake you're actually fishing, you can use water out your pond in the back garden, I use the water out the ponds on Blackheath near where I live, and just flush them out for about 12 hours before you're going to fish with them, and then they're absolutely bang on. Now, I'm just using the boilie approach, Adam's doing something completely different. He's using boilies, but he's using them with loads of maggots, and he's feeding them with a special additive to make them taste even nicer. So let's get round to his swim and see what Adam's doing with maggots. Right, I'm just going to go through the bait I'm using with you. Um, for the last few winters, I've been using maggots in, in some quantities, and um, I'm using them on this session. It's a tactic that I've got a huge amount of faith in. And, um, I do a couple of little things to make them more attractive and, uh, and more potent, as, as it were. And, and one of the main things I like doing is getting a, a nice bucket, a few, quite a few pints of maggots together. And the night before I go fishing, I, I dose them up with Activate um, liquid, which is a really nice, rich smelling liquid. If you put that on your maggots and give them a good shake up, what you'll find is that by the morning, they actually take it on and they feed on the liquid. And you look, you can see on the, the feed spot, the black, the black ball is uh, on the outside of the maggot. You can see it actually growing and pulsing. And if you actually pop one, it smells of Activate liquid. So you can, you can get your own flavored maggots like that. Really, really effective. What I do just to, to sort of get it a nice powdery and, and uh, more potent mix is I add some ground bait to it. This is a, a fish meal ground bait. Um, some matching Activate pellets, they go in there as well. I'm going to give it a good shake up. I add some uh, Activate syrup, get it as smelly as I can. And lastly, I like to crumble up some Grange boilies and put those in. Um, the reason for that is that sometimes the fish can get a bit preoccupied on the smaller food particles. And by fishing, um, or by feeding pieces of boilie, it gives you the option of actually fishing a small piece of boilie on the hair. So you don't always need to actually use a maggot rig. You can just fish a piece with maybe a small plastic maggot or something. That's how I've been taking most of my fish. To put the bait in, I've been using a spod, um, clipping it up and getting all my, rod, all my rods marked with tape to the area that I'm fishing in um, and just basically putting it in at the end of the day so that when I turn back in the morning, if I can get in the swim before everybody else, get on the gates nice and early, uh, I can just cast the rods out, clipped up from the previous night and hopefully the bream and, and the carp and whatever else is out there has been feeding on the bait. Dan's using a different method of bait application, catapults and hand of God as he calls it, which you'll see later on, but I've been doing it solely with the spod uh, and fishing PVA bags attached to the hook. I'm just resting my swim for a little while, and while I'm doing it, I've come down here to the Tea Party 3 swim just to show you the different methods of putting the boilies out. Now, I'm doing the same things when I'm fishing and when I'm baiting up at the end of the day. So there's several different ways you can do it, depending on how far out you're fishing and how much bait you want to put in. First of all, the old trusty catapult. I use very, very strong elastic on my catapult because I work it, if I don't pull it back very far, the boilies don't go very, back very far. If I pull it back a long way, the boilies are going to go a long way and sometimes I'm having to bait up 50, 60 yards out. So I've got a small pouch on there that doesn't take a lot of boilies. Oh. It's lining it up with that island. In the wind, that's gone right into the margins of the island, almost too far. So one more pouch full just to get the right range. That's gone right out to the margin of the island, maybe 50, 60 yards away. Now, a major problem on all these sort of waters, especially in the winter time, are seagulls. And you can put four or five baits out at a time. And over here, you can get 20 or 30 seagulls and they'll get every single bait before they've got to the bottom. So the way to get round it is to make up a PVA bag. Just a funnel web bag with about 10 baits in it. They can't pick these out of the water. When they do, the bag breaks and most of the baits get to the bottom. And the other thing about them is, they go much further than just boilies on their own. I mean, I'm not going to give this maximum on here because I'll be casting it over the top of the island, but that's gone right next to the island with virtually no effort at all. I've got a strong wind behind me, but if you can't get the boilies the distance, if you put a few in a bag as well, they're going to go a lot further. So not only do they all get to the bottom when the goals are there, you can actually get small baits even further. And if you want to go further, 
that's what you want to use, a throwing stick. They're difficult to master, but once you get the hang of them, you can get baits out over 100 yards. So let's have a look at how to use a throwing stick. There are two types of throwing stick available. This is a curved stick, which is the one that I prefer. It's very, very lightweight, and you can put loads of baits out at once with it. And the thing you must have with a throwing stick to get into a rhythm is that a little boilie caddy. I've got about 200 baits in there and it's going to enable me to get into a rhythm, a few baits in, out they go, a few baits in, out they go. So I'll just show you the technique. If you've not used one of these before, most people end up putting them straight into the edge. So if you aim a little bit higher, and it's a bit like a car, so just watch me. I'm going to put four baits down the end of it. and they've actually gone onto the island. That's how far it throws them. We have got a lot of wind behind us, so I'm gonna put a few more in. And if you watch me, I'm rocking back onto my back foot. And then as I go through the stroke, that's it, nicely out by the island there. As I go through the stroke, my body weight's shifting and it's going onto the front foot. And you'll notice as well that I'm going straight up and straight down. The mistake most people make with these things is they go across like that and the baits curve out and go all over the place. So you just want to get into a rhythm, four or five baits at a time for this sort of distance. Out they go. And even with a 14 mil bait, but with the wind behind me, I can probably get these 70, 80 yards if I just put a few in at a time. And what I'll do is during the day, I'll work out how far five or six baits go. And then I know when it gets dark and there's no seagulls about, I can get that same amount of baits exactly the same distance. So that's the throwing stick. If you want to put loads of bait out, then you want to be using one of these fellas. That's what we've nicknamed the hand of God. It's basically your landing net handle with the landing net taken off the end with one of these sort of ground bait chuckers, if you like. You can use them for tipping bait just into the edge if you want to, but I can get about 20 or 30 baits in this, and with the wind behind me, I can get them all the way out to that island, probably 50, 60 yards away. So just scoop a few up out the bucket, like so. And then I'm basically going to almost cast these out. So if you watch, it's almost like a cast over my shoulder. That's sort of two thirds of the way to the island. Once you get into a rhythm with it, I'm gonna use the wind, I'm gonna chuck them right up in the air and use the wind to my advantage and get them right out by that island. There you go, that's like 30 baits at a time right out by the island. And that's what I've been using when I've been finishing off my session last night. I put about a kilo of bait out in about two seconds. There you go. So if you're looking to put loads of bait out in absolutely no time, the hand of God is what you want. Well, it's just got towards bite time and uh, the bream have just arrived, which is a really good sign. It's where there's bream, there's probably some carp. Really good to have some feeding fish in the swim. That's a, a good sign. Right, let's have a look. Now, who wouldn't be pleased with a fish like that? To be fair, probably at three in the morning, I wouldn't be, but on a day trip like this, great big bream like that, fantastic fish, and when they're out there feeding, they draw the carp in. I've got the rod back out on the spot. We'll put the bream back, and hopefully the carp will be along soon. Well, no sooner have uh, I got these rods back out in the area and I'm in again on the same rod I had the bite on earlier on and it feels a lot better than the first one. Not really doing a lot at the moment, just feeling nice and heavy. Oh, it's just started to shake his head. Oh, just felt it tip over his dorsal there. It's a horrible feeling. I hope we get this one in because he feels like a nice 20 pounder at the very least. There's been fish crashing out in front of us 
for pretty much all of the day. Just the odd fish, and I think they've moved up this end off the back of the northerly wind. As I said at the start, we had 19 degrees last week. Today it feels about two degrees. I think it's actually seven degrees out of the wind. Big board up there on the surface. I've got the other two. Oh, oh I thought he'd come off then. Oh dear. My heart is in my mouth. Right, let's just move forward onto this bit of reed. God, it's windy. That is a biting, biting northerly wind. Come on, baby. Let's see ya. I've got back leads on the other two rods, which is helping keeping the line away. from this fish which is just boring around in the edge. Oh, come on baby, let's have a look at you. No point rushing it now. He's just powering off again, doesn't like the shallow water in the edge here. Oh, it's a mirror. It looks like a good one as well. Just take me time. Keep that rod nice and high and bent. God, he's going, really going this fish. Adam and myself are using real contrasting rigs. I'm using combi rigs, using a hybrid material. And Adam's got really light mono hook links on and we're gonna show you both of those later in the show if I can get this better in, that is. It is really, really pulling. God, dear, oh dear. How about this for a bit of spring conditions? There he is. Come on, baby. Come on. It's a big, long fish, this. Every time I go to pick the net up, he's, he's powering off. I'm going to wait until he's really beaten before I pick this net up because uh, he's a big, powerful carp. Come on, fella. Come on. Come on, come to Papa. Here he comes. You are mine. Get in that net. Yes, come on. What a result. That is a top, top result. That is a 30 pounder. A big, long 30 pounder. What a result. Wow, that is one of the nicest fish I think I've ever caught. Whew. Cool, mate. Mate, you had that on for a while. I wound in and came round. A spectacular mate. fight, wasn't it? Mate, it is a proper. You got a good one? Proper big one. Hey, happy day. <laughs> Do you want uh, to get the rod? Yeah, yeah, take that, mate. <laughs> right, let's get this net undone. It's like a proper big one. It's a chunk, is yeah. it? Yeah. Excellent. All right. <sighs> Dan, that is definitely <sighs> over 20. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh yeah, lovely fish that is. Mate. Scaly look one. Look at that. 
Still got leeches yeah. on him. He's been he's been holding up for the winter somewhere. Cool. That's a it? cracking looking <laughs> fish, mate. Yeah, gorgeous. Was he coming off? Never, mate. Little size Brilliant. eight wide gape. Excellent. Let's get that out of the way. Do you want to get that out of the way and I'll get him weighed up? All right. Just bang it up there or something, mate. Tuck. <sighs> right, I'll hoist him. You read him. Ready? Yeah. Well, mate, you have got. A 41.9. Shut up. 41. Shut nine. up. Did you zero? Yeah, I zeroed them. 41.9 Shut ounces. Shut up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> mate. And that is a winter carp because it was snowing an hour ago. How about that? <laughs> is it really? It is, mate, yeah. Oh, wow. it was only about 21. That's incredible, mate. Awesome. Well done. Let's have well, we'll have some him. shots of him, shall we? Yeah, definitely, mate. Get the camera. Get the camera. And as you can probably hear, the fuzz are driving by outside. We're in the middle of Walthamstow, and that is 41 pounds, nine ounces of mirror carp. What a beast. Look at that. Absolutely to die for. Mm. Thank you, my love. Oh, don't think Walthamstow's two and three's ever done a 40 pound mirror. So this fish is at his top winter weight, probably because I've been feeding them all winter. So thank you very much to Kev and the boys at Mainline. Oh, superb. I'm speechless for once. Okay, my darling, you can go back. Give you one of these. It's very nice to make your acquaintance. Look at that. 41 and a half. Wicked. Let's get her back. Oh. Okay, my love. There you go. Well, we are getting close to the end of day two. Um, you probably can't tell, but it's absolutely freezing. Um, to get a big fish like that at 41 in conditions like this is just an absolute result. Um, but we are going to hang it out. We're going to stay right until the end. The complex shuts at seven today. So the rods will be out till half past six. I'm going to rebait the swim again um, and obviously try and get back in here again tomorrow morning. Um, Adam's still struggling around there. The fish haven't appeared in front of that swim like they were yesterday. And I think what we're going to do is he's going to move around tomorrow and fish this same area of the lake because the fish are obviously up here in numbers. So. Uh, I'm going to hang it out until the very last minute and hopefully get another one. Good morning. We're back on Walthamstow for the final day. Um, as you can see, the skies have cleared, hopefully no snow today. I'm back in the same spot again, um, and I've managed to get bait out last night when I left the old hand of God, you remember me using earlier on in the show. Um, and it's looking very good. I've seen two or three fish out there, uh, one right over the middle rod, and uh, fortunately this morning, all three casts went perfectly first time. So uh, that always gives you a better chance if there's not too much casting in the swim. I've just trickled a bit of bait out with a throwing stick just to put a few baits over the top of where I baited up last night. But before I've actually cast out, I've cleaned all of my lines. And the reason for that is with all the undertow here, there's lots of stuff getting caught on the line. And it's much easier for the fish to see the line if there's all bits of dirt all stuck down it. So I've used the number one reservoir behind me, whacked out a long way, got my fishing towel and just wound the line back through my fingers just to get all that muck off the line before I cast out. 
Remember, I'm using fluorocarbon and back leads as well, so I'm trying to keep everything pinned to the bottom as much as possible, because I think if the fish see the line, they're going to be off. And that's one of the things I've noticed this winter, when I've been fishing over at Walthamstow 2 and 3, most of the people have got their bobbins set right at the top and have got really tight lines. And these fish are used to getting fish for for years and years and years. They come into an area, there's two or three lines going straight out, they're going to spook away from that area and you probably won't get a chance. Now, Adam's moved again, I think that's about four or five times during this session. He's behind me now, over in the far corner, and he's just chucked, chucked out three bags just somewhere near the fish. He hasn't cast right into where they're crashing out in the middle here because he doesn't want to spook them off. So what we're going to do now, we've been talking about rigs the whole way through. Obviously they've been really successful with that, with that big one yesterday. We're going to look at my rigs in detail now and I'm going to show you how to tie them as well. And then after that we're going to go around to Adam's swim because he's doing a completely different thing to me. And we're going to have a look at his as well. This is the type of rig that I use to catch that fantastic 40 pounder. So if I talk you through it, first of all I'm using the hybrid material and I've stripped that away using a stripper tool so that I can tie the hook on. And the hook's been tied on with a knot similar to the knotless knot, but it's actually a whipping knot that you use for whipping the eyes on rods. I got taught it when I was a kid and I've used it ever since. After doing the knot, I've put on a rig ring. And people ask me at shows all the time, why do you use those little tiny micro rig rings on the hook? Well, it's actually to allow the hook to turn and catch hold better, and also it will slide back down the hook as the hook starts to penetrate the mouth, so you get a better hook hold. It's really easy to put on. All you have to do is put the hair through the ring, and then tie a simple overhand knot, and then pull it up tight, and that's it done. It's locked in position, and then I've got the hair coming off the end there that I've just tied a simple overhand loop in. And if you tie the loop too big so the hair's too long, all you have to do is do another simple overhand knot in the loop and that makes the knot of that loop a little bit bigger and shortens the hair down. So I can go from a 20mm bait like I was using yesterday to a 14mm like I'm using today with ease. Now the next bit down is the shrink tube, that's really really important. From the underwater filming what I've done is shorten the shrink tube down and it's not curved in as much as it used to be. So I've just steamed that over a kettle, a little tiny bit of shrink tube and then I've got probably a centimetre of exposed braid, that just helps the hook lift up into the mouth and allows it to turn and catch hold. And at the other end, this is the key, right down at the other end here, I've used the stripper tool again to take the coating away before I've tied on my link loop. And that soft hinge there allows the lead to penetrate into the soft bottom and still leave the major part of the hook link laying flat on top. And to keep it lying flat, I've got a bit of putty on there. And a little tip, if you're winter fishing, put your putty on top of a kettle, it will soften it up, and you can fold it around your hook link and cut it off and get it nice and small like that. And to camouflage the whole thing, as normal, I've used a marker pen and just flecked it down the hook link just to get it to blend in with the silt. It's quite a light hook link, really good on gravel, but on silt it stands out. So with a black marker pen, I've just flecked it down there, smudged it along, and that's turned it into a completely different looking hook link. And lastly, I'm using a twig as a boilie stop and the reason for that is these washed out baits are very very soft and if I use a normal boilie stop there's every chance it's going to pull through and out of the bait so the bait will come off on the cast and behind me all those brambles have got about a million hair stops on them so that's what to use for soft bait so that's the hook link I'm going to attach it to the lead system now and talk you through the lead system and that is the whole setup I've got a two ounce square pair lead on a lead clip the lead clip and the rubber are attached to a safe zone leader and what I've done with the safe zone leader, I've cut the ring swivel off the end and replaced it with a quick link. And basically what will happen is this rig will turn from a semi-fixed rig to a running rig in a split second. So as the fish shakes its head when it feels the hook, the lead's just going to slide down the leader away from the fish so it can't use the lead to throw the hook out because we've actually seen that happen in the underwater films. The safe zone leader is the silt coloured one, obviously because it's very silty out there. I changed the colour of my rigs to suit every lake bed that I'm fishing. And then sitting down on top of that is one of the safe zone flying bat leads, just to pin that last 10 foot of the line on the bottom, because I think these fish are so paranoid about the lines in the swim. So that is my soft bottom rig, a fair bit shorter than most people will use. And that little soft hinge at the other end of the hook link is the one that does the business. So if you're going to fish soft bottoms, that's what I recommend. I've nipped round to Adam's swim for a little while just to talk about his rigs because they're completely different from mine. 
the hook link's like, ugh, like really, really long, and I can't, I can't deal with that at all. But before we go on to the, the length of the hook link, what it's made from, um, talk us about, tell us about the hook bait, and because you, you've got two things on there. So what are they, and why are they on there? Well, what I've done is um, I'm trying to make um, the hook bait as unobvious as I can. So um, I showed you earlier with, with my bags, which is maggot and tiny bits of pellet and chopped boily. What I want is when, I, when the bag actually melts and breaks down, I want the, the hook bait to be as inconspicuous as possible and actually appear like the rest of the feed. And it does, when it breaks down, you, you've got a, a plastic maggot there, a bit of boily, a real maggot nicked onto the hook and nothing stands out. So right. away from the trend of popping it up, glugging it, using a yellow one or anything like that, just making it the same as what they're actually coming in to feed on. So you're making them, the bag's drawing them in and there's no difference between what you've got on the end and what's, and what what's coming out of the bag. Yeah. Excellent, right, yeah. okay. Um, quite a long hair as well, and then you've got a little bit of uh, silicon tubing right the way around the hook. So why the length of hair and why that, that much silicon there? Uh, well, the length of hair firstly is just something I've been doing for quite a long time just because it's different and I think it, uh, certainly when you're using it with smaller hooks, and light hook links that I'm doing, I think it just helps the bait to separate and act more natural and it's just, most guys are fishing it tight to the bend aren't they, so yeah. it's to be different as much as anything else, but the longer, longer hair combined with the silicon right round there, as far as I can get it, really helps to pull the hook point down. So it makes it turn over and Absolutely, catch up? Absolutely, yeah. Right, cool, okay. Um, I'll take it the maggots there for camouflage is it, or is it just... Yeah, it's just for camouflage and also just to have something live on, attached to the metal as it were, I think just helps to make it a bit more natural. Okay, and you've got the knotless knot there, but I see a, a different from how I do mine, there's a couple of turns over the top of the knot, so how have you done that and, and what's it for? Well that's quite an important one Dan, the, um, I'm using this uh, the IQ uh, soft in 10 pounds, right. so cu coupled with a, a size 10 wide gape, all the size 12s I've been using as well, um, a lot of people worry about using that for really big fish, yep. um, a lot of guys you know using mono or fluorocarbon hook links quite often say they go by the eye of the hook. And, they break, and if they're going to break they break <laughs> that's there. That's where they go yeah. Right. Um, I've been getting away using this quite light tackle, even in heavy weed, with, with fish well over 30 pounds, and I haven't had a single one go on me, and I think that's partly down to the knots that I've been using. So if, if you tied a normal knot, knotless knot on, yeah. on mono um, or fluorocarbon, when you, you finish the knot, when you pull it, it actually contracts and flexes, doesn't it? It moves yeah, when yeah. you pull it hard. Right. And I think during the course of a fight, you've got that going on all the time, coupled with the line running over the, the edge of the eye with a downturned eye hook. Yeah. I think it just wears the material down and I think right. after, after a really lengthy fight it can go. Um, so the two most important things that, that I do when I'm making this um, rig using these light links is always whip on the opposite side to the eye closure. Yep, okay. And then when I finish the whipping down the shank, I do three turns around the outside of the barrel on the way back. And what that does, it effectively locks the knot solidly. So when you, when you pull it, no matter how hard you pull that now, it doesn't move stays completely the not, fixed. Not, not doing that exactly, effectively. Exactly, yeah, right, okay. I think is, uh, is helping it keep its strength and uh, right. good, little, good little well. tip. Yeah. Good little tip definitely for the, for the light monos. And then mm -hmm. like a massive bit of putty and, and most people would think straight away that's a pop-up but right. it's not is it? Yeah it does look a bit like a strange pop-up rig but um, I've been using putty on my bottom bait rigs for more than two years now and uh, I, I don't know what it does I think it just makes it more awkward for them. It pulls the um, pulls the hook point down into the bottom lip. Um, I don't know exactly what it's doing. Maybe you could have a look on the underwater can for me and <laughs> let me know. But I'm convinced that it's making a big difference. It's working really well um, for tench and, and also for some big um, carp that I've caught, which are, are sort of known to be very rig shy. Right. So it's sort of become part of all my bottom boat rigs now. Right, okay. And then um, <coughs> hook link wise, you've got 10 pound IQ, much longer than I would use. What's that? Foot long, something like that? Yeah, about that, yeah. Why such a long hook link? Uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, uh, generally, it's, it's the same as, as the length of hair and so on and so forth. It's just, just trying to be as different as possible uh, from other rigs. And I think if you drew up the common denominators, you've got a lot of guys using six-inch links, coated hook links, size six hooks, three-ounce semi-fixed lead. So it's, it's just trying to move everything as far away as possible. And then a running lead and an inline running as well. Mm. Which are, we, we use that in shows one and two <coughs> out in France, or Andy did, to, to really good effect. You haven't got a backstop on that at all, so what, why are you using it that way? Um, I've liked, again, inline running leads for a long time, just because they're different. I think that the, the swivel sticks a little bit, as you can see, and then pops out. Um, it just gives you a different presentation. I'm, 
I don't put a bead on it, although I don't think that would ha harm the, the results of it. But, you know, if you, if you were fishing and you were sort of like a little bit off your rods in the sleeping bag at night, you don't want a fish going 10 yards with your lead in one spot. And, and yep. you see what I mean? So yep. I'd probably put a bead on then so the lead went with it. But for the sort of trips that we've been doing, just fishing it running like that, and uh, generally, it's been working really well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's worth pointing out. Adam's been on loads of places in the in the early part, the late part of the autumn, early part of the winter, and done really well on this, haven't you? So yeah, it's a very good. Just because it hasn't rig. worked this time, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you know, I've been fishing with a boilie that I've put, been putting in here all winter. Mm. I know that they love those baits. You know, you've come on here completely fresh. You've done one day on here before, mm. you know, and so far it hasn't paid off. But We've got a couple of hours left, and yeah. you never know. As Humble my maggot said, might. It, it only takes a second to get a row, that's Absolutely, what they say. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for that. That's something that people can put into their own fishing. Um, hopefully, we'll get one. We'll see. Maybe the maggot will turn. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon of uh, the last day, and the middle rod has gone. I'd seen a fish crash over the top of this one earlier on this morning. Pulled straight up to the top. Doesn't feel like the monster from yesterday, but. Uh, He's very welcome all the same. It's really charging around this fish. But the other rod's back leaded, so hopefully it's not going to be a major problem. He's right down in the edge now, so I'm going to creep forward and just uh, get a tighter line on him. I'd predict that this is an upper double or a low 20. Certainly not the epic battle that we were having yesterday, but very welcome all the same. Oh, we just rolled on the line there. But he's going absolutely mad. My God. He's really trying to get rid of the hook, this one. If I get him in, it's going to be a miracle. He's going ballistic now. Oh, gone. He comes straight in and doing all his fighting right in the edge on this. It's another good fish, that is. That is another good fish. There's about between 40 and 60 30s in the two and three reservoir. Oh, he's really, really trying to throw the hook, this fish. It's unbelievable. I haven't played one like this for a long time. Twisting and turning on the line, on a very short line. He's doing everything he can to throw the hook. Oh. He's a good fish. And he's a real good fish. Just take me time at this point. Don't rush it. Keep the rod up nice and high. Just keep a nice bend in the tip. These are powerful rods, these infinities, but if you just use the tip of the rod and not the midsection, you don't put too much pressure on them. And have a good mirror. Come on. Tire down a little bit. Tire down a little bit. Come on. Get in the net. Yes, got him. Oh. That was a bit hairy. <sighs> Just about got that in there. That is another big long mirror carp, that. <sighs> and there we have it. 34-4. What a result. Done the whole winter for 130 on here. And I've had two over 30 in two days. Absolute result. <clears throat> These fish are solid as a rock, absolutely solid, full winter colours, and it still feels like winter behind me, that's for damn sure. What a beast. We took a massive gamble coming over here. The weather's been really good, and it's turned really, really bad, and uh, everybody in the crew thought we were mad to come back, and the gamble has paid off in spectacular style. What? a beast. For a chance to see more of the underwater footage shown in this series, check out the State of the Art Underwater Carp Fishing Series, available from all good tackle shops.
This episode of Thinking Tackle is in association with Daiwa Infinity Rods.